Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be uh, quite um, purposefully um, talking uh, from a nutritionist perspective. Um, my own background is I'm a human nutrition scientist, but I've had years of training in agriculture and experience in it. And I've spent the last 30 years being involved in all types of um, micronutrient intervention research programs, including food-based smallholder uh, strategies. And so I'm going to offer my view of a key linkage which doesn't exist yet, but in which I think some progress is being made. And in my mind, this is the only way that really nutritionists and agriculturalists are going to start to be able to communicate on the, wave, same, on the same wavelength. Um, so I have, somewhat to my surprise, heard a number of people, including some nutritionists at this conference, say, tell us what nutritionists want. It's not clear what nutritionists really want. Well, to me, the answer is very clear. We need agriculture to supply the right nutrients in the right amounts. And it is fine that farmers be seen as the providers of nutrients. Uh, this is obviously optimistic, um, but I think it's a, an ideal perspective to start with, especially with the people in this conference. Please let us remember that humans need 40 essential nutrients at least, at least all of the time, practically every day. They don't just need iron, vitamin A, and zinc. And agriculture is the way to provide that. If we cannot get those nutrients from food, then we should go to fortification or supplementation. Something that I haven't heard anybody mention really here is the important point that agriculture is the way to nourish the entire family over the lifespan, and I'll come back to that point. I think um, you're missing a huge opportunity if you just keep talking about women and small children here. The nutrition community, of which I see myself as a, a very integral part, has focused on micronutrients quite correctly in the last 20 to 30 years. But in fact, agriculturalists and even nutritionists, I think, don't understand the extent to which gaps still exist in delivery and integration of approaches. And this just shows an example of that. In pregnancy, women are given iron and folic acid supplements. Um, they may be given multiple micronutrients, but we're not even clear on whether that's the appropriate strategy yet. Lactation is kind of a free-for-all, perhaps nothing is given to them. First six months of life, infants are meant to get breast milk without proper evaluation, really, of the um, adequacy of micronutrients, which is very inadequate in many situations if the mother is not well nourished. Six months to three years, it needs special programs. Vitamin A capsules, high dose, iron supplements, multiple micronutrients in powders, lipid based supplements, fortified complementary foods. These are the approaches being looked at to provide enough nutrients in a very small amount of calories for children that age. And then finally, what about everybody else? We reach everybody else through fortified staples, um, usually iron and folic acid, without really often appropriate evaluation of whether those nutrients are needed and what amounts. And there's biofortification, which is increasingly supplying vitamin A, iron, and zinc. All the rest of the household is critically important. There are school children. Interventions do improve children's um, uh, development. Maybe not their growth so much in these later years, but their activity, their cognitive function. There are adolescents, including pre-pregnant women. If you just intervene in pregnancy, it has limited impact. Um, there are non-pregnant women. There are adult men who do the work in agriculture, and increasingly there's a huge proportion of elderly who are almost entirely neglected. These have a right to be well-nourished too, and food through agriculture is the way to nourish them. 
The other problem, of course, is access, feasibility, sustainability, cost, and so on, are very challenging for some of these micronutrient delivery programs, and they're just not adequate to meet population nutrient needs, even though they are achieved and have achieved very much. So this is my view of a platform that is needed to coordinate agriculture, fortification, and supplementation with the goal of meeting nutrient needs. You have to start with food intake information. People are so afraid of it, but now we really know how to collect that. Uh, we, need, we only need about 100 people per population group, two days on a subsample. We have to do that. This tells us what people are eating, who's eating it, and how much. Then we need food composition tables. This also is often held up as a major obstacle, and it shouldn't be. I could go on about that separately, um, but it's really not such a problem uh, as to be a major obstacle here. When you have a food intake data and nutrient intakes from that, then you can estimate the percent of the population who are below their estimated average requirement for nutrients. That's the right point to measure, not RDAs, but estimated average requirements, and those above upper limits. So if you're worried about sodium and sugars and, and uh, saturated fat, that can be worked on too. And we should do that for each nutrient we think is important in each environment. We identify the gaps in that um, uh, flow of information between what foods are supplying and what people need. Then on the left, I've put plant sources, and on the right, I've put animal sources of foods. Those are very different. They do not substitute for each other in terms of supplying nutri nutrition. You look then at strategies based on plant sources to see what can be done to improve the intake of traditional and local foods that supply the good nutrients in plants, energy, vitamin A, C, folate, <coughs> and to some extent iron and zinc, but not very effectively. Uh, we look at traditional ones, local ones, regional new ones, biofortification. And on the right, I have animal sources. Again, those supply huge amounts of nutrients. They're totally critical for um, young children. And, and without them, you have to fill the gaps in other ways. So we look at traditional sources, local sources, new breeds, um, different uh, ways to improve animal source food production, microcredit, and so on, uh, on that side. Then the gap has to be filled by fortification and supplements. And the goal here is to get a low proportion of each population group with intakes below requirements and not above at the upper limit for nutrients. So one step I think that's going to help this a lot is the development of this intake monitoring assessment and planning program, the IMAC program, which is being beta tested and will be released by WHO. This is a very user-friendly software program. It gives you um, information on estimated average requirements and upper limits for different population groups, or you can put your own data in, your own bioavailability estimates too. So then it gives you the estimate of the percent below and above particular nutrient intakes, and it can simulate the effects of changing the intake of specific foods or of fortification. So it does answer how much of what is needed. In future, um, I've been involved in the development of this, um, not the main developer. Um, we need to link it to food composition databases, such as the InFoods International Base. Dietary quality indicators should be calculated through it. Food fortification software is being linked to it, and uh, so on. So it is really a platform on which other things need to be added. The last point that I want to make in terms of technological development is the um, slow but actual progress in nutritional status biomarker development. 
These biomarkers are really, really critical um, for assessment, but I really think they're particularly critical for the monitoring and evaluation. We keep hearing how we're not sure whether there's been any impact of these programs. Well, these indicators are one way to see that there's in impact. So there's now a field-friendly test for vitamin A. Um, we're getting a little bit into multiplex assays, which do a bunch of nutrients um, uh, together. Vitamin A and iron status for a long time actually has been able to be um, analyzed this way, but a field-friendly method is being developed. Um, an anemia screening tool to see whether it's malaria, uh, or other forms of micronutrient deficiencies. And there are even some five nutrient assays under development. And finally, the cutoffs that are needed in order to evaluate the need for interventions, efficacy for interventions in different settings are being worked on. So for example, the Biomarkers and Nutrition Development Project of NIH, an international project, is um, looking at different cutoffs for research purposes, clinical use, programs, and policy. Of the recognition that the kind of markers that are used in different situations um, are, are change in terms of their appropriateness. And WHO is also revising their um, biomarker indicators. So in summary, my uh, premise is that agricultural planning should aim right from the start as a very early and important priority to fill nutrient gaps and reduce excess intakes. That is the language in which nutritionists and agricultural folks can communicate. We do need a user-friendly method that informs priorities based on simulating the nutritional impact of different kinds of approaches, agriculture, and nutritional, and harmonize these and not duplicate them with fortification and supplementation. And finally, I think this program could be a very major um, provider of leverage through uh, improving communication. These are the goals we want. This is how far we've come. These are the strategies that are available, making it more effective and more efficient through focusing on priorities which are really going to improve nutrition and not just duplicate the, other, the, the roles and um, impact of other sectoral programs. Thank you.